Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Avery Slater, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English at the University of Toronto and faculty fellow at the Schwartz Riesman Institute for Technology and Society. On behalf of the Schwartz Riesman Institute, I am pleased to welcome you to the first SRI seminar series event of the fall 2023 semester. Whether you've participated in past sessions, or if this is your first, I hope you find this series to be a welcome and inspiring place to learn more about important research at the intersection of technology and society, and to discuss the societal implications, beliefs, and challenges of artificial intelligence systems and data-driven technologies. We have an excellent slate of speakers lined up for this semester. I'm looking forward to hearing from our many illustrious guests. Before we begin today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. These and other indigenous peoples across Turtle Island develop complex and effective governance systems based on respect for all life and the intelligence of the natural world. Today, this land is still home to many indigenous people working to reclaim their rights to self-determination. We're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we may be joining from different places, we invite you to reflect on the history and relations of the land you're on. A few uh, logistics before we begin. This session is being recorded. Aaron will speak for about 50 minutes and will take questions after his talk. During the Q&A portion of the seminar, we encourage all participants to use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting controls to ask a question. If you could put a short version of your question in the chat, that would also be helpful. Um, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Aaron Hertzman. Aaron Hertzman is a principal scientist at Adobe Research and an affiliate professor at the University of Washington. He received a BA in computer science and art history from Rice University in 1996 and a PhD in computer science from NYU in 2001. Hertzman was a professor at the University of Toronto from 2003 to 2013. He worked uh, with Pixar Animation Studios, Microsoft Research, Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab, Interval Research Corporation, and NEC Research. He's published over 100 papers in computer graphics, computer vision, machine learning, robotics, human-computer interaction, AI, and art. He was an associate editor of the ACM Transactions on Graphics for 10 years. Hertzman's awards include the MIT TR100, a Sloan Foundation Fellowship, a Microsoft New Faculty Fellowship, the Canadian Association of Computer Sciences Outstanding Young Researcher Award, and the Stacey Prize for Natural Sciences, as well as several conference best paper awards. He is a fellow of the IEEE and ACM. So without further ado, Aaron, the floor is yours. We're excited to hear your talk, Can Computers Create Art? Great, thank you so much for this generous introduction, for having me. and. Uh... You should be seeing my slides now, or they should be coming up. Um, so this is a topic that you know I've been I've been giving versions of this talk over several years, and it's really uh, gone from being kind of this niche thing to something that everyone's talking about. Um, and just before I begin, I want to just briefly mention a little bit of my own, a little bit about me that I I um, both I work as a computer scientist and develop algorithms uh, inspired by or for developing art, uh, and I also have. Uh, as Avery mentioned, um, undergrad degree in art. And so I like to draw and paint as uh, a hobbyist and often these interests uh, intersect. So this is um, from my thesis, a uh, installation where you could walk up to it and paint pictures of you. And this was shown in New York in some exhibitions in uh, 2001. Um, so as I think people probably know by now, the past decade has been really a whirlwind time for AI driven art. And I think that um, the sort of the modern era kind of began around 2015 when this deep dream method came out it was very exciting, at least for some people uh, for, for a few weeks. And the neural Strauss transfer became very popular. And 
within a few years or within you know, a short amount of time, as these new machine learning algorithms started to become um, useful for making things, people would start experimenting. They would make neural generated movie scripts. So this is one from 2016, and they would make fun things like neural generated band names. Um, they would make knitting patterns. So just, just this long period of exploration of what can we do if we generate uh, new data, new, new uh, things from our existing models. There was also a move towards the fine art world. So this is an exhibition that I saw here in San Francisco um, in 2016, based on deep dream and neural style transfer. And then it moved into popular culture. So this is a, the uh, TV show, uh, Silicon Valley from 2018. I like it. It's really cool. So who painted it? A machine. It's actually the first work of art made by AI to be sold at Sotheby's. So that was a joke. Six months later, again, gener work, generated work of art was auctioned at Christie's for a half a million euros. And it was signed in the corner with the loss function uh, for uh, GANs. I just, I, you should have been hearing video on that and I don't see any chat, so uh, I'm gonna assume that worked. Great. So these things got into the popular culture and then um, uh, by uh, last uh, about a year ago, text image started to uh, come out. People could type in text prompts and generate images and then, then it really blew up. Uh, along the same time, academics have been um, developing new software algorithms, and sometimes the claims are fairly strong. So here's a, a very this is a very nice paper from 2017, but it says in the abstract of the this you know computer science paper, we propose a new system for generating art. The system generates art by looking at art and learning about style and becomes creative. So this is a fairly strong claims that are being made about what the algorithm does and what the code does, and this is picked up by the media. So for example, this was. There are headlines, artificially intelligent painters invent new styles of art. The AI artist that can create its own painting style and critics even prefer its work to human efforts. Well, what do the real critics say? So here's Jerry Saltz, who's one of the premier art critics in the world, uh, talking about that work. Initial thoughts, incredibly dull, generic, boring. The programmers are not freeing up the program. I want the robot to tap into its inner robot. Be free. So it's a little hard to tell how serious this is, but you can see that what he's criticizing is not the, you, he's bought into the idea that the robot is the artist. And he's just saying it's not a very good artist. So there's just this idea here that the, the code is the artist. And so there's a real question that people have been discussing for a very long time, which is whether computers can be artists. And some people, at, when I talk to people, they say it's just a question of te technological capability. So like, uh, as long as we have enough GPUs, we could, the computer can be an artist. On the other hand, uh, some people I talk to say that, of course not, because art requires intent or expression or something like that. And these don't seem like very uh, you know, scientific statements to me. So it'd be nice to have a little bit more concrete notion because you, I think we have this intuition that art is this human thing, or some of us do have this intuition. It's like having consciousness or a soul but these are almost religious arguments. Um, and so there's kind of four main points I wanna make here in this presentation. The first is that these uh, AI software systems are tools for people to make art, much like many past technological tools that people have used to make art. Um, and I don't think the computers themselves can, can be considered artists and it's unlikely this will change, but I'm gonna make some predictions as to what it would take or when this could change. Um, I do think the practice and the process of making art and how we understand art is going to be transformed by these two new tools. Um, and I don't want to make very specific predictions, but uh, I want to point to a lot of historical analogies when pre previous technological advances have changed or, or affected how we produce it or, or share it. Um, and I think that these analogies provide a lot of really useful lessons. Um, and as, you know, we hear a lot of things today to the effect of this has never happened before. These tools are going to democratize art or they're going to kill art. And I think these things really oversimplify thing, things and we can learn a lot by looking at um, historical lessons. And to that point, I think it's worth uh, observing all of these different times in history when technology has transformed art, transformed the way we make it and the way that we think about it. So for example, uh, in the 15th century, Van Eyck developed uh, effective techniques for oil paint, and this allowed artists greater control over tones, and it was much more practical as in terms of just the practicalities of making and moving and producing art. And of course, Michelangelo um, didn't like it. He said that uh, the people who use oil paint are amateurs, it's too easy. 
um, within the Western tradition, there is a trend towards increasing realism. So as painters and the, the um, oil paints got better, the, um, artists were able to create these really you know, amazing illusions of visual reality. And I think it's hard for us to appreciate just how special and unique these pictures were, that in the 19th or 18th century or before, the only way you could see pictures like this that look real on some level is to see the work of a highly talented, highly skilled artist. And so the identity of what an artist is and what art is, is highly tied to the ability to create this visual realism and this illusion of realism. And so the threat to that came from photography. It, photography was first the uh, plaything of tinkerers and amateurs would fool around with it and just see what happens. This is the, the first known existing photograph. Um, and they would just you know, take pictures of, you know, Instagram their food. Um, this picture here is the first picture that's uh, thought to have a person in it. There's someone in the lower le left here. Um, at the time, the, these pictures would take 10 to 20 minutes to expose. And so the person uh, on the lower left there seems to be having his shoe shine. And that's why he's standing still. Everyone else who was walking, uh, walking along would have been blurred out. Uh, people would take selfies. Um, but really, the uh, impact became visible with the, um, uh, or uh, was threatened when Daguerre presented his invention to the public in 1838. And rather than patenting it, the French government bought him out, bought out his patent, because they felt that this would be of such value to society. And even from the initial presentations of the daguerreotype, um, artists felt threatened. So the classical painter Paul Delaroche is quoted to have said, from today, painting is dead. The great uh, Turner said, this is the end of art. I am glad I've had my day. Because this technology, photography, does the thing that artists do. It makes realistic pictures. At least that's how it looked uh, at first glance. So what was the real impact of photography? Well, it's a long story, but I'll just point to a few um, things. So one role of photography was for portraiture, which um, at the time, if you wanted a painting of, your, of yourself, you had to be pretty wealthy. Uh, you could also uh, get a daguerreot um, a silhouette made, which is just, you know, looks like this. And so it's not a great likeness. So this is sort of like the alternative. And so once um, the daguerreotype uh, was presented publicly, within a few decades, a lot of portrait painters and portrait studios essentially uh, either went out of business or had to change the way they worked. A lot of painters ended up uh, retraining as uh, portrait photographers. And even though it was a cumbersome process, um, you had to sit in a chair locked in, you know, with your head in a brace, you know, holding stiffly onto the armrest for say eight or 10 minutes. And yet as a result, we have these fabulous uh, portrait photographs from the 19th century of people like the photographer Nadar here, which is who's captured in really fine detail. Um, and Nadar made a lot of really other, a lot of other really wonderful pictures. So the portrait painters uh, saw their livelihood threatened and transformed. And within a few decades, one painter photographer said, one knows that photography has harmed painting considerably and has killed portraiture, especially once the livelihood of the artist. So this is a technology that took jobs away from artists, basically, as uh, he defines it. Now, there's also the, the more high end, the more formal end of, of um, art. And there was a long discussion, is photography art? And uh, on one end, there were more of the tinkerers and people who would play around with these things and see what the tool could do. What does it mean to make pictures with cameras? Uh, one of the things that a new technology does is imitate old technologies and old art forms in order to become, to advocate for its legitimacy. So there is a um, movement called pictorialism in which photographers would compose uh, scenes in the style of uh, classical composition. So classical painting on the left, a uh, photograph on the right that had the same kind of like um, stage set uh, uh, composition as in classical themes as the, the paintings. And as uh, painting developed in response to photography became more atmospheric, the pictorialist photographers also made their work more atmospheric. And eventually within, you know, by the beginning of the 20th century, photography was accepted as a fine art form. It was being shown in uh, major uh, uh, museums and galleries. And through a long process of many, many decades, um, it, was, it became accepted as a separate distinct art form from painting. On the other hand, during this time, um, there were the, the haters. So Charles Baudelaire, the, the poet wrote, 
in his review of a photography salon, if photography is allowed to stand in for art, it will corrupt it completely, thanks to the stupidity of the multitude. So that's presumably us. And so photography is this thing which threatens to replace art. Now, the artists themselves um, responded to this by rethinking what it was to make a picture. So Whistler, who's most famous now for the painting of his, his mother, wrote, the imitator is a poor kind of creature. If a man who paints only the surface he sees before him were an artist, the king of artists would be the photographer. It is for the artist to do something beyond this. So now he's saying photography uh, isn't really the right thing because painting is about more than just that. Um, but even more, Van Gogh wrote to his brother in the pivotal year of 1888, accurate drawing is not the essential thing to aim at because a reflection of reality in a mirror would not be a picture at all, no more than a photograph. So now he's saying that photo photography is an art because realistic pictures aren't even art. And then within a few decades, the modern art movement was off and running. And even in the manifestos for the modern art movement, in this case, a statement on Dada, they essentially said that photography dealt a mor mortal blow to the old modes of painting. And so because they have a way to, to do the thing that they had you know, intended to do to make realistic pictures, now artists need to break themselves free of the imitation of appearances. So in summary uh, of photography, this looked at first like a tool that automated art. You press a button and the thing makes pictures for you, which is what artists do. Uh, and many artists criticized it, feared it, or disparaged it. What actually happened was we have a new art form of photography, which is viewed as related to, but distinct from painting. The old art form was invigorated. And when I say invigorated, I think the modern art movement came about in part in response to photography. Our entire 20th century notion of what art is, is in response to the development of photography and, and other factors. Um, now, jobs were affected. Um, the poor, uh, many people lost work or had to trans change the work that they were doing. Um, and But on the other hand, image creation was also made available to hobbyists. So people could be carrying around cameras with them where they went. Now we all have cameras in our pockets. And this has really changed the way that we communicate with each other, whether we, we make images and, and uh, share them with each other. There are a bunch of different trends here, but many of these things repeat with different artistic technology that have been developed over the years. And I'll, I'll mention others. They're not all the same. There's unique things about each one and the new AR, AI stuff has some unique properties as well. But there's a lot of things that are also in common among new artistic technologies. So in, in this modern art movement, which came about in response to photography, I'm claiming, um, one of the things that became questioned is like, what is art? And what are these things? And conceptual art kind of made it suggested that, you know, to, you know, to oversimplify a little bit, whatever an artist does can be art, that you know, the form is sort of independent from whether or not it's art. Um, now, when people talk about what is art, they often use very narrow definitions of this, this domain or that domain. For me, for the context of this talk, I, I take a very broad view. Art is anything that could be like painting, conceptual art, music, dance, movies, video games. Um, uh, I take a very broad view of what we call art. And then people within specific domains often use a much narrower uh, definition. Um, one of the important conceptual artists was Saul Lewitt. And he wrote quite a lot about how the idea of the work was really the artwork itself. Um, and these works here are ones in which he wrote down a list of instructions and then someone else would actually do the painting following the instructions that he um, he provided. And you can, in fact, buy a solo wit and have it painted in your home if it's removed from the old location by his estate. So he is not painting it anymore, but it's still his artwork. And this is actually an important precursor to computer generated art because he's basically providing a list of instructions. He's not doing the painting, but he is the artist. So once computers were able to make pictures um, at, by the 1960s, people started making art with them. Um, and these are some of the early experiments uh, by people like Michael Knoll, Frieder Neke, uh, Vera Molnar. And this is before we had programming, before we had code. Um, this is like plugging in wires or flipping switches or however they used to program back in the 1960s. And they would write code to um, generate uh, different works of art. And the one on the left is simulates or is modeled after a Mondrian piece that has a similar uh, appearance. And in fact, they did comparisons of asking people, do they, you know, which one uh, the, the, um, the, the Mondrian or the, the generated one, which one do they like better? And, and, you know, people were split. 
Harold Cohen is one of the most important AI artists of the 20th century. He started out uh, in a modern art tradition where he would write rules for himself to uh, you move uh, pens on a piece of paper or oil and follow those instructions. And then he discovered Fortran and he's like, why am I writing, you know, doing all this by hand when I can write code? But basically he spent the rest of his career writing more and more sophisticated pieces of code that follow a bunch of rules that are generated figurative drawings and paintings and then uh, print them out. Um, and his work is uh, shown and collected by a lot of major museums and galleries, you know, Tate and Whitney and so on. And, and we'll come back to see more of his, uh, his thoughts later on. Um, you know, artists always experiment with things. When we had digital painting, uh, people would start painting with uh, pens and tablets instead of brushes. Here's a painting by Andy Warhol. Um, another, I think, important 20th century AI artists or, or class of artists are evolutionary artworks where people would um, develop systems that have a, a grammar or a set of structures for virtual creatures or uh, vir screensavers. And then uh, users will give feedback. Um, I like this one. I don't like that one. And they would mutate and evolve uh, in a process inspired by a biological evolution. Um, and again, these are also you know, uh you know, shown in various major art institutions. In the more popular world of computer animation, uh, okay. computer animation really arose as a collaboration of artists and scientists. Um, I, I've certainly talked to people who thought, oh, the computer just does everything. It just makes the, the people work. And that's not really how computer animation works. And in fact, in the early days of um, the Lucasfilm graphics group, when before the, these guys found Pixar, they would go down to Disney and try to convince them to adopt computer technology at Disney and the, you know, Albert Ray Smith says, at the time, uh, animators were frightened of the computer. They felt it was going to take their jobs away. And they spent a lot of time telling people it was not, it's just a tool. It doesn't do the creativity. And anyone who's tried to use computer graphics tools or computer animation tools to make animation knows it's really, really, really hard. Um, and a lot of the, the, the technical, some of the technical skill is different. Drawing is different from moving uh, key points on a 3D model. But these skills of acting and performing through virtual characters are really very similar between uh, hand-drawn animation and computer animation. And now we see, you look, watch the credits, not just of any animated movie, but almost you know any feature film. There's you know such as you know Avatar, which is supposedly a live-action movie. You, there's an enormous number of people who are being employed with a lot of very specialized tasks in creating animation and bringing characters to life. Um, in my own work, um, uh, I started out with um, my, my thesis, my first project was I would start, I developed a system where I would start with a photograph and it would generate paintings um, and, you know, such as this live version of it that I showed earlier. So this was about, um, this was 1998, I first did this, so I guess 25 years ago. And this is a bunch of code that I wrote that follows a set of rules for how to decide where to place brush strokes in response to the image that comes in. And you can read the paper, you can implement it yourself, and you can understand all the details of how these images are created and what the um, what the algorithm is doing to make these pictures. Um, uh, I also, as part of my thesis, found it really hard to write a bunch of code to make to figure out how to make these pictures or how to set all the rules. So I developed the first algorithm for learning these exact things from examples. So this is um, a method in which patches of texture are copied and rearranged from a source image. Um, and this you know, made it much easier to essentially train a model from an example, um, but it still is following code and instructions that I wrote. You can read the paper and you can implement it yourself and understand uh, how it's making decisions and what it's doing. And so when we use these machine learning tools, we are using code that people have written and designed and a, us and a user is then using it in some way. And so one of my favorite GAN artists is Helena Saren. And she you know, makes the analogy to watercolor. If you've ever used watercolor, you know it kind of feels like it has a mind of its own. You have to learn how to work with it. And she says, making pictures with uh, GANs is similar to this, that you have to figure out how to work with what the GAN does. And yet throughout this whole history of as soon as people use computers in some way to make art, there's the question, is it really art? And we see the exact same question um, asked by headline writers over and over again, as if none of this history exists. Um, so for over 50 years, people are asking, is computer art really art? Um, and I say yes, because these computers are tools that artists use, um, and all this art is human-made. Now, one thing that's new, I think, to the current um, debates that are happening is that it comes at the same time, comes along with this AI hype. And I, I hate the term AI. I would rather we call this all computer software, because these things are not intelligent in, this, in the same way that 
uh, we think about with um, biological organisms. But yet the hype uh, is, you know, even from 1958, the presentation of the first perceptron, which was essentially a linear classifier, uh, the Navy says it will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its own existence. And so this is a hype we've been living with for 60 plus years. Um, in 2017, artificially intelligent painters invent new styles of art. Last year, computer design this week's cover, um, you know, essentially giving the autonomy to the algorithm when in fact it was being used by people. And this, when we call these things AI, we tie into these fictional narratives of AI. AI, for most of us, means things we see in movies. We see you know, Terminators. We see friendly androids. These are things that are basically like human intelligence, but a little bit off, You know, maybe a little emotionally um, uh, immature or psychopathic. But they're basically like people um, with some you know, difference. But these things that we are calling AI right now are really basically curve-fitting algorithms. Uh, for the most part, you have a very large data set in a high dimensional space, you, de you define a very high dimensional mathematical function and you fit the data and you write a bunch of code around it to, um, you know, take you process inputs and outputs. And that's basically all of these modern AI algorithms really are. And yet we have this incredibly um, uh, strong propensity to interpret human-like or intelligent uh, behaviors from very simple procedures. So if you're not familiar with the ELISA um, uh, system, it's worth looking up. Someone wrote a very simple set of rules for the, 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 something that would simulate talk therapy, and people had emotional interactions with it, and the emotional connection with it, not knowing it was just a bunch of code. And so you can have, you can believe, if you don't understand how a piece of code works, it's very easy to uh, interpret human intelligence in it. And this is really risky when we have a world in which things are giving uh, AI systems autonomy um, as if they are human-like intelligences when they're really just code other people wrote. And I, here I, I live in San Francisco where there are cars driving around without drivers, and yet um, they can they can break the law, but there's no one to give a ticket to, and so they there's basically no consequences when they do. So I, I think it's dangerous to call computers artists because it supports the idea of AI sentience, of that AIs are autonomous, um, and humans should have responsibility for the artwork and for the other products of AI systems. And I think there's real harms in treating this so-called AI as though it were uh, human-like intelligence. So that's the description of where we are now. Um, but I, there's also an important question that we asked about whether computers could be artists in the future. Because we all know definition of art changes and our understanding of art changes. Could that happen? Uh, when could we view computers as artists? And again, I think it's a hard question to figure out even how to pose the question. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? Now, I want to emphasize that it is hard to make good long-term predictions. So I'm, I'm making predictions here. Um, but there's specific, some things are hard to predict uh, and um, more than others. Um, so if you went back 60 years and asked people of the 1960s, what will the city of the year 2001 look like? They might say, oh, well, we'll be riding to work in our moon buggies to our dome, moon domes, because this is what the science fiction of the future looked like. If you ask people in the year 1960s, what will the computer of the year 2000 look like? Well, it'll be big and small enough to fit in the room of your house and answer uh, 20, you know, figure out 100 edges of pi in less than a minute. Our predictions of the future were very bad. You can peer, like take the old TV show Star Trek, look at what the computer's function was versus you know, how, how information and communication happened. And we have all this hype of like people making predictions that AI will give us better French fries or lead a nu nuclear war or in the world or something. And these predictions seem you know, un unconnected with the reality of the technology. Um, now to make the predictions about um, whether computers could be artists, I think it's also worth, um, one thing I often hear is, especially com computer scientists, that if you have code that makes good pictures, that makes it an artist. And I want to make a point that um, this is people, you know, a thing, lots of people go through this thought process. I've thought this at the time. I, oh, maybe, maybe my code makes it an artist. And I write the code. And I'm like, well, you know, it's just code that I wrote. Um, you know, let's look at the example of Harold Cohen, who um, worked for decades as a fine artist, um, where he would first paint uh, on his own, and then he wrote code that made pictures. And he went through this thought process as well. Let's see what he said. 
Ten years after that, I would have said, look, the program is doing this on its own. Another ten years on, and I would have said, the fact that the program is doing this on its own is the central issue um, here. It was producing complex images of a high quality, and I could have had it go on forever without rewriting a single line of code. How much more autonomous than that can one, can one get? So he's written code that is producing artworks, that is showing in museums and galleries and being bought and all that. So does that make him an artist? Well, of course, that's exactly the point. It's virtually impossible to imagine a human being in a similar position. The human artist is modified in the act of making art. For the program to have been similarly self-modifying would have required not merely that it be capable of assessing its own output, but that it had an, its own modifiable worldview to provide a basis for any meaningful assessment. So I think this is a thought process that a lot of us go through. I made a computer system, I wrote some code, it generates images. That makes it an artist. And then you run it for your wall and you're like, you know, it's missing something. And so Harold Cohen's answer is, what if it could grow and have a worldview? And there's lots of other answers other people have given to this. But there's always, as soon as you've written the code, you get you set it in motion, you're like, well, you know, is this thing really an artist? It's just, you know, following the instructions I gave it. Um, and in fact, we can get, you know, pretty spectacular things from very simple pieces of code. So this is one, uh, th this is from an algorithm that you can run for a long time. And the first time you see it, if you haven't seen it before, it can be pretty dazzling. Um, there's a lot, you know, it just, it's surprising and it feels in a sense creative in that it produces stuff um, continually for a very long time that you've never seen before. So if you haven't seen it, that's the mail brosap. It can be basically described in 10 lines of code. It is a very simple algorithm and chaos theory tells us that it's very unpredictable. And so we have, we have had for decades with this work, with Harold Cohen's work, work that feels creative and autonomous and surprising and unpredictable. And, um, and yet we don't consider these things artists, even though we think that those are the things that artists should be. Um, and so when we use our current text image systems, you write a text prompt, you get a bunch of pictures out, you know, like I, I, I use these systems and I'm like, wow, this is really good. Like better artists than I am, it's better than, and no human artist can produce images in any style this fast um, and, and such high quality. And yet these things are just pieces of code. They are matrix multiplication and thresholding. Um, so it's really not, it, it's hard to view that as anything more than something following a bunch of instructions it's given. Um, one other um, response that sometimes come up is, you know, again, it's part of a broader debate, aren't we all just computers? And um, you know that depends on your definition. I don't have time to, to mention it, but I really like the paper um, by uh, Richard and Lillicrap basically discuss this question. That it, it, you know either the answer the obvious answer is obvious depending on how you define computers. But the main thing I want to say is that we are people and computers aren't people. And my point is that um, uh, people are artists, and you, know, you have to be a person essentially to be an artist. Um, and one example of this is I would say morality applies to people like you, you know, it's immoral or unethical to hurt other people uh, in, in a lot of situations. Um, you can't kill people, um, but you know, turning off your computer recycling, it's really fine. That's uh, you know important significance of the, the difference. We don't really have a scientific understanding of what makes us different from computers, but we know there's a difference and we know that we don't know enough to understand it. And knowing that there's a difference is, is very important. Um, Another thing we often hear is that art requires intent and expression, that um, to be an artist, you have to be able to uh, express an intent. Um, and I think that this doesn't help us for this particular discussion because these things are easy to automate. Obviously, you know, you can just write some code that generates uh, a meaning or an intention for a work. You know, you can type that into uh, a system and it will generate a work that expresses an emotion. So that's really not, um, I think, a good tool for helping us understand computers as artists. Um, one other response I've heard, um, I've once in a while I've given this talk and someone says, well, doesn't the definition of art hold the answer? You just look up the definition of art and that will just tell you whether computers can, can be artists. Um, and, and that doesn't really work because when people try to define art, they are attempting to describe our existing practices. They're looking at all the things that have been called art in the past 
and distinguishing those from things that are not art. You know, why is uh, theater an art form and not spectator sports? They don't really tell us anything about who or what can be an artist. And here I'm really trying to predict the future, our future notion of what art is. So again, I go back to the idea of what, are, uh, well, if an artist makes it, it's art. The question is what can be an artist? And I want to argue here, or propose a hypothesis that art is really a social behavior. It's a thing that we do as a product and a function of our social relationships. Um, so for example, social behaviors are things like, you know, conversation, gifts, and marriage, fashion. Um, fashion is an example of something that has, you know, all these things have sort of dual purposes. Um, we wear clothes to protect our body from the elements, but we engage in fashion because of, for social reasons, for how we want to look to others and how we want to identify for ourselves and as part of a group. Uh, and I think art is, has a lot of this similar qualities. We share our art with other people. We go to see other people's art, look at it. We talk about art. We talk about role of art community and art in our society. We buy it sometimes very publicly. And then we display it to you know show to uh, other people to show our values or our wealth or our taste. We teach it to communicate uh, our um, values to the next generation. And these are all social elements. And I really believe that the evolutionary idea of art, art is something that came in part, uh, came out of our evolutionary history. It has all these functions uh, within the social groups of providing for gifts and for sharing and displays of status and so on, which are all social properties. Um, and you know, you don't have to believe the evolutionary theory, but the, the idea here is that these are things that we do, you know, primarily as a function of our social relationships. Now, of course, people, get a lot of personal value of making art. Like I really value my time that I spend drawing. I find it very beneficial for myself. But my argument here is really that the reason we have art is for social purposes. So for example, you know, lots of evolved behaviors end up being pleasurable and beneficial on their own. So for example, I would say we talk uh, for the purpose of communication. That is why we have speech. But people may still talk to themselves or sing in the shower and so on. That doesn't disprove that speech is for communication. And it's the same thing, I think, for art. Um, and so my main points here are that we care about people. We care about the, the art that people make. We care about art because people make it and the role that people have in our society making art. And computers are not people. And so until that changes, I don't think that we will see computers as artists. And I don't know that it ever will change. You know, and just as one example, there are lots of natural processes, the mountains and cliff sides and flowers and astronomy, all these things that can be sublime and beautiful and transformative and um, uh, have a lot of the same properties that we ascribe to art. And we, we don't consider, uh, at least in the Western tradition, the, you know, the cliff sides to be artists or na nature to be an artist um, because there's no human uh, behind it. Um, so with that background, we, we can make a prediction. When can a computer be an artist? Well, I think if we ever have conscious human level AI, then of course there'll be artists, but that might never happen. It's science fiction right now. Um, we, now we do have bots that have sort of social and conversational properties, Eliza and Siri, Alexa, Cortana, Nekoatsumi, paratherapeutic seals that have sort of social-like uh, interactions with us. But if we understand how they work, then we don't have the same kind of um, in, uh, relationships with them. So I think it's possible um, that people could infer um, human-like qualities to them, but I think it's often them being misled. Um, and finally, just software that you pull off the internet and press a button and hit go. Um, I just don't see how we can understand these things as artists without being misled as the nature of how AI works. Now, that's a statement about what is art and what is not art, um, but there's a lot of other, you know, things that happen. I think that um, these new tools are, are going to potentially change art a lot in ways that are very complex and they're hard to predict and hard to uh, anticipate the specifics at least. So for example, here's Les Paul, who's one of the main innovators of the electric solid body guitar. And he played very nice jazz and swing tunes and very, very pleasant stuff. There's just no way that he or anyone else could predict the effect that his invention would have on Western pop culture, on pop culture in general, on music on, and so on and you know, the music that people are making 30 years later. Um, another example from a different era, when recorded music was invented, um, performance musicians uh, argue, uh, campaigned against it because it was going to take away jobs from performance musicians. 
So this is from a campaign from the 1920 from 1927, in which musicians that were would perform in movie theaters were uh, hopping mad, were like very angry that people were going to add recorded soundtracks to movies uh, instead of hiring musicians to perform in the movie theaters. And they had said that like them having a recorded soundtrack can't replace a human musician. And indeed, a lot of these jobs for performance musicians um, were re replaced by movie soundtracks. And now with re recorded music has really transformed the way we appreciate music, how we understand it, and the kind of music that's made. One example being uh, um, hip hop, which was a product of many factors. One of the factors that was important for hip hop was this technology of having dual turntables and a fader and a microphone. And then basically, you know, two people with a record collection could make music and they made invented new kinds of art forms that couldn't exist without this technology that were really transformative uh, for popular culture. And of course, all the trans, um, there's, you know, at least when I was growing up, there was a lot of people saying, this isn't really music, this is just noise. And this is a case where I think um, uh, the, the aesthetic artistic judgment is also a product of other societal factors, essentially uh, racism. So um, the, as I've said, I think it's hard to make specific predictions about exactly where pop culture will go, where will the art forms go. You can't predict what artists are going to do in the future, how they're going to use the tools. But I think there are trends that we can predict from given all of this uh, history. Um, the first one is that the future AI tools won't look like what we have today. So all of the egg, um, all the discussion and you know turmoil and debate right now is around text to image, which is you type in a text prompt and you make a picture. And that's a really impoverished way to make pictures. It's exciting and interesting and, and very fascinating, but the tools of tomorrow are not going to be that. They're going to be much more, offer a lot more creative control. They're going to be specialized in different circumstances. They're going to have um, fit into existing workflows and so on. Uh, and I, I really believe that artists are going to find new ways to use these tools. They're going to make uh, new things with them, uh, new styles and genres and techniques will emerge to the point where we can't imagine not having these tools, just in the way it's sort of hard to imagine not having photography today. Um, more people will be able to create and communicate in ways that they wouldn't have before, that you can you know, make pictures and share things with each other um, uh, in, in a more casual way with affordances that are not currently present. Um, I think there's disruptions to artistic labor markets that are that need to be reckoned with, and these things end up being, um, you know, a new uh, tool in the sort of battleground of uh, labor economies that um, we need better for, uh, you know, protections for in our society. Um, and there's you know difficult ethical challenges that result uh, as a product of that. And thinking about you know how do these tools work, how do they get produced, how do we how do they get used, um, but um, I'm very much a believer in art and artists, and these things are, uh, as the tools get technically better, um, our bar for what makes what we we'll expect will get higher as it has in the past. And we will always be discerning and care about the new unique things that great artists can make using these tools. We'll get bored with um, the same run of the mill text to image results and the bar for art will get higher and higher. We will always need artists because we will always care about what people are making and people are sharing. And we don't care about the algorithms except as you know a temporary fad. And in short, I think that we will once again rethink what art is. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Aaron. Fascinating talk. Um, we're pleased to move now into our discussion period and uh, we do welcome questions from all participants. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you can use the raise hand function that's in the reactions uh, bar on your Zoom window. Um, and you can put your a, a short version of your question into the Zoom uh, chat. Um, so uh, when you ask a question, if you'd be able to turn on your camera, uh, if you're comfortable doing so, that would be great. Uh, and our team will send a request for you to unmute uh, when it's your turn to speak. Thank you. Okay, so our first question uh, today comes from Sheila McElrath. And go ahead, Sheila. Hi, Erin. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, 
I had a whole bunch of questions. So I read your abstract and I had a whole bunch of questions planned and you you answered all of them for me. I love the narrative and the analogy to photography, which was something that 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 I thought about too. Um, you answered this question, you know, can, can computers be artists? But one of the questions that I had coming into this was, can computers be creative? And and which is a slightly different question, which I find harder to answer. And and I guess the other thing I was wondering about was was the implications with respect to responsibility in law. When we not think so much about visual, I know you defined art very broadly, but when I think about um, generating some of the issues that are arising now with generating text, with copyright, with what can and can't be copyrighted, and again with respect to to uh, accountability. So and and uh, you know thinking about AI having its own its own goals and intentions, its own uh, uh, modicums of expression, and and whether so can AI be be can AI be create or can computers be creative in your opinion? Does that fall under the same set of of uh, measures as as being an artist? And, and what are the implications with respect to responsibility in law and some of the things that we questions we see emerging in society? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Great to see you again. Yeah, while. you too. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, um, so creativity is another word people struggle with. I know. Uh, and, and there's um, one of the like classical psychology definitions of it really just focuses on the product of like, you know, this is a creative work because it's surprising. Um, and I think that that kind of misses the point of of how we understand creativity. Um, I see creativity, you know, one way I see creativity is sort of a gift where you say like, oh, that thing you did is really creative. It's the way we praise people who did surprising things. Um, but for me, um, as I both, you know, do research and um, paint pictures, for me, a lot of the experience of creativity, or creativity is really about an experience. It's about being surprised and producing something that you didn't even know you were going to come up with, it's that you start out with an idea or exploring like, oh, this paper is going to be about this thing, or I'm going to paint a picture that looks like this. And then you start doing that thing or exploring that space. And then something happens that you did not even plan. Um, and that to me is the, and then you mean it's even better that we had intended in the first place. And to me that I feel like a lot of that's what about creativity is. It's, it's not just surprising to the people who saw it. It's surprising to the pe person who experienced it. And that's not something that really like, you know, we can think about writing codes that code that models that process and uh, simulates that in some way. But I think in the end, you know, this code is following instructions. And I just don't see how you could use those notions of creativity um, when describing a system that is following a set of instructions that it has been provided. Um, with regard to your your second question, I think we respect you know, that relates to law to some extent when you know you read. Uh, justices or like the patent opinions um, and the patent office says, well, we can't call it art because the system's not being creative or the, I mean, the, that that discussion comes up in those legal discussions. Um, and so there's some connection there. Great, thanks. I have follow-up, but I won't ask you now another time maybe. Thank you. Great. Um, we had a hand from Josh Sucker earlier. Josh, did you want to ask a question? Uh, sure. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I was, um, in regard to your um, assertion that, um, and it would, it would seem to be quite true on the face of it, that it was the advent of photography that forced uh, the visual arts, yeah, uh, you know, painting in particular, to um, to have to come up with a new way to go on as art. Um, but would you agree that uh, that there probably was more to it than that? And what I, what I'm getting at here is, if you look at all the companion arts surrounding the visual arts, and 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 keeping in mind that all of these arts talk to each other and are interaffected by each other. And they're also interaffected by political uh, ideas and philosophical ideas that there was a larger movement going on that was in reaction against the implicit assumptions of, uh, of, of uh, industrial technology. In other words, that there were, you know, kind of enlightenment era philosophical underpinnings to it. And that's what you see being reacted against in a lot of different ways and a lot of different art forms. So would, would you maybe 
allow that it would have been inevitable that there would have been that that the visual arts certainly you know not at all uh never to be to find itself uh behind the other arts in terms of trying to pushing push push ahead in terms of expressing new ways of looking at the world would have found ways to critique those underlying assumptions uh even if uh, photography, you know, if, if one can imagine, you know, I mean, it, you can't really extract photography from the equation and say, well, you imagine everything else was the same except that, you know, that you, without the invention of photography. But, you know, just as a hypothetical, um, it seems to me that there still would have been this movement, necessary movement away from, um, you know, realism uh, in, in the arts for, for these other reasons. Um, I, I definitely, it's definitely true. I'm very oversimplifying. Um, and modern art was product of many factors, response to industrialism, reaction to ra the rationalism, enlightenment, World War One. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I don't know how to reason about counterfactuals about whether it, uh, how things would have been different otherwise. But I think we can very specifically point to ways in which um, artists uh, responded to photography, the way they wrote about it, what they did in response to it. Um, and uh, as evidence that uh, photography was, at the very least, an important factor in the development of modern art. It certainly wasn't the only factor. Thanks. So I see also a question that was connected to Josh's question uh, earlier in the chat from Haiyan Chang Daman. I don't know if Haiyan, you wanted to uh, ask that question. It was about the Industrial Revolution. And you're there. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I, can you hear me? Uh, it's fine. No, yep. no, that was in response to the uh, the previous comment. So I'm I'm actually fine. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll go to P. D. Magnus. And for those of you who may or may not be waiting, if you can use that uh, raise hand function uh, in the reactions bar, that that will help. Thank you, P. D. Magnus. Um, hi. Thanks for the really fascinating talk. Um, so. Insofar as counting as an artist is a social process or a social status, it seems like part of whether a, whether generative algorithms get to count as artists isn't just the question, will they eventually be people? But it's a question of what kind of social, how the social institutions will develop. Do they come to be counted as artists? So do you think that's right, that part of it depends on how, what future social developments are sort of in parallel with or even separately from whether the algorithms get complicated enough to count as to be people. Um, well, I mean, anything's possible. Uh, in, in, hypothetically, um, that uh, we could all, you know, have a different relationship to these machines, that we could have different, um, you know, so social uh, consensus about these things. So I think you know maybe these these things are sort of, um, you know. Six and one half is the other. Um, my 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 hypothesis, my prediction is that it's really about the social status and the social relationships of these machines, um, and everything else. Everything else sort of secondary to that. Um, I'm not, maybe I'm not sure if I understood your question, but maybe that, that's related. Okay. If there, did you want to? Oh, I was just going to say. So it seems like the social status of the machines, though, might develop or change independently of the question whether they get have been whether they've become people or not um certainly i mean so they they certainly play important roles in our society um, sure. and affect our social interactions um and we have sort of quasi social interactions with them now and there's various psychology studies to show that people kind of have these some sorts of like quasi social relationships with computers um uh, I, I have no idea how those things will develop, um, but uh, so it's possible that there's some further level of non-person social interaction that would affect our you know, how we view them as artists. Um, I, but I, I don't really have any further prediction there or, or guess what that would be. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, next we have Prajna. Prajna, you have a question about design thinking, I think. Um, hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm currently studying design thinking in my classes, um, and this was sort of, sort of uh, extending from an interesting discussion we had yesterday, actually. Um, I'm wondering how you 
relate the two terms art and design and whether you consider computers to be designers if you don't consider them to be artists? Um, I, I guess I confess I haven't thought that deeply about what makes a designer a designer. Um, uh, I think of, you know, there's certainly a tactical skill involved that could be potentially have some automation. Um, I think of, and design means different things than, you know, architect design, in, in architecture design is different than, you know, UX design or something. Um, but I think a lot of what a designer does is uh, at a high level, like they translate understanding of a domain and how people use a system or use a building or interact with a design um, and translate that into proposals. And I feel like a lot of that is, I'm not sure if I could articulate it. I feel like there's a human element to that, that, that couldn't be automated that it, um that you know like if you're communicating values through design for example then there's some uh human authorship there um beyond that i don't i i, I don't think i can say anything useful though great um so now uh anthony s i think you were you had a comment earlier mm -hmm. uh yeah um, my question was uh, going back to talking about whether uh, AI can be creative. Um, you kind of said before that AI kind of follows a set of instructions, which kind of implies that they don't have an intent. But even when we're looking at human art, you could argue maybe even in the music industry that there could be songs that are extremely generic, where let's say the artist chooses something that maybe in the culture right now is popular, they choose a generic beat, generic lyrics, but we would still consider that art because it comes from a human. So if we were able to make an AI algorithm that takes maybe a type of sound that is popular at the moment, but still chooses their own and makes their own production lyrics, what would be the kind of the difference between the two? Or do we consider both not to be art? Um, I, I would say, like, I mean, it's a really good question. Like, these, these, are, these are difficult cases. You know, I would still say that somebody who designs an algorithm that mimics popular styles, you can do so very effectively. And we have lots of code that, you know, that produces pictures that are showing in museums. So by any standard, um, you would think of it as an artist. But I'd still say that, like, the thing is just executing code. Whereas if somebody, a person is doing the minimum bare amount of effort of just, like, I had an idea, I typed in text, I produced images, or I spliced together things in a very unoriginal derivative way, I would still say that's art. I would just say it's just not very good art. Um, and really, like, you know, it's a value judgment. It's really like other axes you care about. Is it original? Is it uh, um, impactful, expressive, emotive, communicative, ethical, and so on? Those are the things we really care about. Okay. Uh, Phil, you're up next. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I I missed the time, so I came in very late. I thought it began at 11.30, but in fact, it ends at 11.30. However, being very involved in art, I sort of understand the situation. It seems to me like photography did play a very important role. But it played the important role in the sense that it could render a representation of the world much more accurately, you know, the pen of nature so to speak, which means that in some sense, it took away that sort of physical representation of the world from visual artists. But that was that was fine. That was fine because it just liberated art to deal with the inner scape, the psyche, and the concepts within. But that relationship really meant that, in a sense, it liberated art from understanding that tools could be used in different ways. And I just wonder whether with AI, particularly as it gets more, more and more comprehensive, whether it does not become something that while it is a tool, it has encroached in the uh, subjective narrative of the picture rather than merely the illustration of the representation. One of the things that modern art did was because it was dealing with the subjective, it was very, it was quite, uh, uh, how say it's open in the sense that it created a juxtaposition of relationships uh, to in a sense, to in a sense confess that this is a simulacrum. 
of the representation and not a objective representation. And I wonder whether, in a sense, AI, uh, by creating an illusion of uh, without that sort of juxtaposition, does not create a seamlessness that's going to be so believable that people no longer understand that it is a simulacrum uh, rather than a reality uh, that it is. So I think that becomes a very, very uh, problematic. So there's two problems. One is whether it has become transcended itself, becoming a tool, but a representation. And the other one is that as a representation, it does not possess enough of the, uh, in a sense, representation is a simulacrum rather than just a true, in a sense, tool of representing the world as it is. That's it, Phil. Yeah, so I think you know, there's a point there that I, I really agree with it, which is that um, there's harm in calling these things artists and the the hype around saying that uh, if we present code and um, call these things artists, then that can be very misleading about what the nature of the art was and what uh, human involved actually did. Um, the, the point about photography was not just that it um, took away uh, the creation of reality, it's that it really threatened artists' identities as to what they did, um, because what artists thought an artist does, you know, visual artists anyways, is like make realistic pictures. And artists felt very threatened. They, all the things people are, well, some of the things people are saying now about AI threatening um, art are the exact same things, well, were similar things people were saying in 1838. Um, and it, now the idea that we see it as a liberation of the notion of art, they did not see it as a liberation. And, and some of those um, jobs were affected at the time, people who were professionally employed to make portraits, or, uh, portraits were, you know, uh, had to change their, uh, had to switch to photography. Um, so all these things that people are saying now around AI is doing these things that artists do are things that people have said uh, that it's replacing artists at different times in history, recorded music and uh, digital photography and, and many other types of uh, computer animation uh, as, as well. Great. Um, Michael Gerzoy, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, Aaron. Uh, good to see you. And thank you very much for the talk. You too. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I wanted to kind of give an example where I think maybe it pushes the framework a little bit. Uh, so that would be, for example, Move 37 by AlphaGo, which kind of at the time, uh, people have certainly commented on it that it seems creative. Uh, and I would say, you know, it's it wasn't exactly created by a system that followed kind of a preset set of rules. There's probably some kind of statisticity in the search, stuff like that. So would you say that kind of if people do see it as creative, it's just a mistake by the people who see it as creative? Um, well, I guess it depends. You know, people mean lots of different things when they say creative. Um, I think... You know, I interpret that comment as saying this human-like intelligence did a surprising thing that would have been surprising if a human did it. And I think that it's fair to say that, like, had a human made its choice, that would have been really um, surprising. Um, uh, and, you know, I hear that example brought up a lot in the computational creativity context. Lee Sedol, the um, Go professional Go player, says that move was very creative. And this is now the evidence that everyone provides for computers being creative. Um, I think uh, that I guess I'm not that creative. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't mean to, you know, yeah, blame yeah. You, but I'm saying this is a very common theme. Um, uh, I think that, you know, these things can do things that if a human did that, we would say that person is creative, um, for sure. Um, but, uh, I, I think that given the same creativity notion to the computer, I think threatens these other misinterpretations. Um, I also think the Go example is a little different from uh, artistic creativity because that's much more creativity in solving a mathematical problem. That's a situation where you say like, it's, it's essentially like, you know, there's a bunch of examples in computer animation where you say like, I want to run an optimization that, you know, satisfies from task. And um, you get these results that are surprising and funny. And, you know, there's a paper called something like this surprising creativity of, I forget, like evolutionary algorithms or something. Um, 
where you get these these things, you know, it just feels like magic. You like write some code, you would optimize this thing, and some unexpected cool thing comes out, and it's natural to think, oh, this thing did a creative thing, um, even though it's essentially finally optimum to a mathematically well defined problem that you found, what you've defined um, through some search procedure. And I think AlphaGo is an example of that. It's essentially a mathematically well defined problem in a search procedure, and it found uh, a solution to that problem that uh, is was unexpected. Right, but isn't uh, sorry if I could ask a follow up. Uh, so, at least I think I'm kind of not by any means a poet, but I sometimes write things that rhyme, and the experience of doing that is quite similar, right? So you have some kind of meaning that you want to convey. Maybe you're a little bit flexible about it, and then you just do a search about how do I fit the words such that they look like a poem. So that seems like ordinarily that would be defined described as being creative, but it also seems very much like a search problem. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of uh, creativity does feel like a search problem, but in a way it feels like um, there's an objective function there that you can't define well. And I feel like in some sense, that's a little bit, of, I mean, that's one difference. It's not the, it's not the most important difference, but a lot of creativity is like, I think I'm solving this problem. And then you do a thing and you're like, oh, actually I'm solving this different problem. Or I don't know exactly what I want, but if I search enough, I'll find it. You know, that that's sort of uh, a kind of notion of creativity that's very hard to implement in an algorithm because an algorithm at some point you, you define the objective function. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a kind of objective function. You know, if, if you think of our search process as an objective function, it, who knows whether you can even you know define that mathematically or not, or whether it doesn't really have any implementability at all. And, and I think you know, like you describe, you like you write poetry for yourself. Like I feel like all of us can be artists, all of us can be poet. I mean, we can all be you know famous, or we're not you know all going to show our stuff in museums. But that act of creativity of someone on their own, just drawing a picture or writing a poem, that that's creativity, that's art. Um, and we don't say that those things are created because you're famous or highly skilled or trained or anything. We say it because it's a person having this creative experience and, and sharing with the world. Yeah, sorry. And just, uh, and we can move on or I, I do want to ask kind of because, uh, do you just think that physicalism is just false? Because it seems like, okay, if you don't, then at the end of the day, there would be an equivalence between... I'm not. I'm not understand. I'm not familiar with physicalism. Well, so physicalism would be the notion. Well, as opposed to dualism, that would be the notion that uh, everything uh, kind of humans are physical processes, essentially. Um, I you know I believe that, and I believe embodiment is important for intelligence. Um, but I don't uh, feel comfortable drawing lines in the sand about that exactly. But you see the question, right? It's you know like if. A human is a physical process, then it's hard to argue that it's also not follow a human also is not following some kind of preset rules. Um, you know, like if you think that we're just computers, then why is it okay not okay to kill people? It's kind of my response to that. Like there's some difference between us and CPUs. Like we are definitely not um a CPU or a Turing machine. Maybe hypothetically, there's a way to simulate human processes. We don't know what that is, we don't know if it's possible. It's, you know, it's like discussing the, um, you know, future, you know, um, uh, you know, economy on Mars, like, who knows what that world will look like when we understand those things. It's really so far from our understanding. I just don't think it's worth um, assuming that we are computers and therefore that everything is equivalent. You know, if you assume that, there's all these other, you know, unpalatable consequences for that belief. Well, or you could just say, you know, a complicated enough computer, you should also not destroy. So that, that's an option. Again, okay. I feel like it's science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a very interesting question from Uchenna Uguo uh, about intellectual property rights and recent legal decisions. Uchenna? Hi. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um, I find the discussion interesting um, because we've, at the Schwartz Fritzman Institute, we made a recent analysis of this particular topic. For those who are, aware, who are not aware, in August, the, a district court in the U.S. made a decision. That's the case of um, Fala versus um, Palmuta. I think I wrote, I, I just put it down in the chat for those who are interested. And basically it said, 
he, the person who was suing was saying, hey, my computer generated this image, uh, 3D image of, um, of a train running on tracks and says, hey, that the computer should be given the copyright as the author of that image so that nobody else would be able to use it and do other things. And the court was very strong in emphasizing that there needs to be a certain level of human input to assign authorship to machine generated art. That's the decision of the court. And in my own analysis, I analyzed it to say that this is actually, shouldn't be seen as a negativity, but it's actually positively helping to increase creativity. Why? Because what, what, when a person is made the author and they're given copyright, they're given the right to exclude, it becomes a form of property. No one else can touch it, except you come and license, relicense it from me. Uh, no, you can't make a, every little increment. The person would say, hey, the machine has done a, a creative job. Now, if you want to further work on that, then you would have to start paying licensing fees. Um, I'll give this analogy, though it's not exactly art. For example, in the area of seeds, the, before a, a person can take a seed and say, oh, let me produce a, a genetically modified or improved version of that seed, they need access to the original seed. If you could see the generated, a lot of the generated art more as a form of seed that should be open, available to different artists to be able to use to advance their creativity, that would help more in sustaining the idea of creativity rather than every time he makes a little increment, he now says, I'm the, uh, my machine authored it. You've got to pay to look at it. You've got to pay to even make any additions on it. Um, for those who are interested, I'll be glad to share the, uh, it's a very short article, just five pages, analyzing who an author is based on the, the decision of the US court and also Canadian law and international law regarding that aspect. Great, thank you. Yeah, so that's a good point. And I think um, it's, it's a good point that, you know, had, the court ruled the other way, it would have been really dangerous if, you know, you could just press a button and, and then the system is copyrighted a uh, bazillion, you know, infinite number of uh, pictures. Um, I think, you know, it's worth pointing out that that, that um, case, some people interpret that case as meaning AI pictures can't be copyrighted, but it was really um, uh, making a much more narrow legal point, which is that mm -hmm. copyright law in the U.S. requires a human author. Um, and this was, you know, there's a precedent um, from this case where, uh, I want to say a baboon had, you know, used, you know, played with some photographer's camera and then PETA sued that the baboon should be the own copyright author <laughs> of that photograph. Um, and, you know, again, copyright law says no. So, you know, that course doesn't, co that court case doesn't say anything about what a computer could be, you know, what images can be copyrighted by people, but it's really like, you know, protected us from a world in which, you know, you can just write code and that just produces a million uh, copyrighted pictures. Yeah. Okay. But anyone who wants to read that, I'll be glad to share it with them for anyone who wants to contact me to read that. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Adam, I see your hand. Want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Um, so not, not really the whole AI sentient thing is a fascinating question, but I I think once as soon as a robot starts acting like Robin Williams, Robin Williams in a movie got got his citizenship. So that's the end of that story. Um, oh, uh, start my video. So sorry, I thought it was oh, on. Um, okay, so my question is: once art, AI art, gets specific, specific um, up, updated to a point where it could do animation frames. Would that be kind of like the end game, almost like a steamboat took over sailing kind of thing? Because I feel like that could, and that is ultimately the last point of the map right there. What's your thoughts? Um, I I think that you know um, there are are already you know machine learning tools being used in animation production now and more. You know, there are a bunch of startups that are um, automating certain things there. But I think in the end, like. If you're just generating animation with code, it's you know people. It's going to be obvious and boring, um, no matter how technically skillful the code is. After a while, and like the really the great movies are going to come from artists who are proficient in using those tools and making new things that we haven't seen before. Mm. Okay, thank you. 
So I want to take moderator's prerogative and ask you a question about uh, what you were saying about modernism, uh, something of real interest to me in my own work. Um, I'm thinking about how photography for modernism represented, for people interested in art theory at the time, uh, represented a crisis of reproduction. And that crisis of reproduction for people like Walter Benjamin allowed this idea that art could be democratized. And I heard you mention the democratization of art in, in your talk. I'm interested uh, in your thoughts on the democratization of art. I guess what I'm thinking about is, is the crisis of AI art a crisis of reproduction as it was for modernism photography? Um, or is there something different about the fact that it's a crisis of generation? Is the crisis of generation the same crisis as the crisis of reproduction? If it is, why is that? Um, and if that is the same crisis, does it have the same stakes for democratization or are there different uh, stakes? And I guess I'm kind of trying to connect that in a way to Uchenna's question about intellectual property rights. So if AI is, is generating art based on essentially style transfer from a data set of everyone else's art, is that, what does that do to the democratization of art? I know that's a lot of different questions, but it seems to me that modernist problems around reproduction and the AI generation problems um, might have some differences, but perhaps they lead to the same, to the same place. What are your thoughts um, on that? Yeah, those are fascinating questions. And I suspect you know a whole lot more about modernism than I do, um, but uh, I have a few responses. Um, I think, well, so I don't, I actually don't like the word uh, democratization of art. I like, you know, that feels like a very you know, Silicon Valley kind of tech here, but mm -hmm. kind of phrase. Um, uh, you know, and there's a lot, because it has a lots of different concepts, which I think are worth you know, discussing separately. I think that um, the, the positive side is providing casual people or like non-experts more ways to communicate, express themselves, more on ramps for creativity and to you know, improve skills in various ways. And explore and create things um that's the that's the positive side of it um uh, obviously there's a negative too um the with respect to the relationship between um reproduction versus generation i think that they're analogous it's not the same thing because we've already been through the the reproduction uh thing and all of the debates that people have about like oh like you know you don't have a unique work of art anymore like does that mean that the 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 aura of the original thing matters or the like you know the new one is somehow worse or and now like you know we've figured out whatever our opinions about that are we figured it out now we have this new threat to our notion of um what made an artwork unique was even though you could reproduce it you know it was still a person made that thing in a way that people understand that you recognize the author's voice in um Lot, you know, in a photograph, um, at least if you know enough about photography. And now with these new things, we don't recognize the author's voice. And we see that words have been put together automatically in a system that um, looks like something that a human does. And so we now have that same uh, crisis, an analogous crisis to what, what we had before. That, that's, that's sort of how I um, see it. I don't know, maybe you have a different view. No, that's, that's great, thank you. Um, Brendan Cassidy had a question earlier, or a, a point rather, about uh, the fact that computer was once a human job title. I don't know if Brennan, you wanted, I saw your hand go up and then go back down. So I don't know if you wanted to ask that as a question. Okay, maybe Brennan's not. Okay, so if other people who haven't asked a question yet, uh, are not waiting to go. We'll go back to Josh. Uh, Josh, if your your hand is, I don't know if it's still up or if it went back up. Uh, it, it went back up. Uh, yeah, uh, Aaron, I'm curious of uh, what your thoughts might be about um, uh, tying together the notion of creativity, human creativity versus animal creativity in the context of what uh, might or might not be art. And then this is kind of a <laughs> very complex question. And then tying these back to um, kind of recent no notions that have been floating around in various fields that, that talk about human beings in, in terms of embodied self-organizing systems that, uh, you know, that uh, function within a larger ecological uh, system. So I mean, 
thinking about human creativity from that sort of biological point of view, you recognize it as something which is intrinsic to essentially moment to moment uh, functioning of not just of human beings, but of all self-organizing systems, that is to say all living systems. Um, so many of these, these writers now argue that one in a certain very generalized sense can talk about sentience as simply this uh, normative capability of all self-organizing systems to kind of create a boundary between them and, a, and an environment that they interact with. Uh, and they maintain a certain purposiveness, a certain goal orientedness, like the bacterium that, you know, that the bacterium's world, their perceptual systems in, in, in the sense that they have, you know, that they have a certain sentience towards their environment is oriented towards, you know, sugar gradients. And that's how they understand their world. Uh, but so the larger point here is that with humans, as well as other uh, living systems, you have a kind of an ongoing continuous creativity. It's a kind of a, a self-reflexive, a recursive uh, creativity. And if we compare this to our, uh, our, 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 our machines, uh, we see that essentially that our machines act, they, they belong to our own self-organizing internal ecosystem. That is to say, they act as appendages in the way that, you know, a bird's nest acts to a bird or a spider's web acts to the spiders. The bird evolves, the, 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 the nest evolves, as the spider evolves, the web evolves. Um, so what I'm wondering here is even though, I mean, you said that, well, I mean, it's a, it's a thorny subject. I mean, some some artists have argued or art theorists have argued that yes, we can ascribe a certain artistic creativity to animals. But um, I, I, I guess what I'm, the lines I'm thinking along here is, is that um, thinking about humans and animals and, and, and distinguishing them from our machines, our present day machines as appendages makes it clear in the sense that we're asking the wrong question. It's not a question of whether ever we might ever develop some sort of a machine and the way we think of a machine in terms of something we make that, we, that you know, sometime in the distant future, if ever we might be able to um, create one that has sentience or that, that is uh, truly creative. I think that from this self-organizing point of view, it's the wrong question to ask is that it will always be an appendage because of the fact that uh, it has this relation to us as appendages or as organ systems have to our body. But animals don't have that relationship. And so um, one could imagine that, say, something like wetware, which we've already, you know, created memory within by by manipulating DNA and test tubes. Uh, in that case, we're dealing with living systems that are already extant, and we can contribute to sort of creating, essentially, you know, sort of steering them in ways that act uh, like computers do in relation to us. But the difference would be these are already autonomous, uh, self-organizing systems on their own, and so it would be a very different relationship between us and them. So. Here you have a notion of creativity, uh, which ties us to, you know, which allows us to think of a, a different kind of a machine. In fact, I suppose you would need, it, it would be so so different a notion of machine that, that one might, you know, have to change the, the terminology. But at any rate, uh, do you think, do you think about um, the, uh, um, at least the idea that even if the note, uh, that, that even given the difficulty of labeling what animals do as 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 being art, um, that they certainly, just like us, are continuously redefining the relationship to their environment, and that is the fundamental creative impetus for both human beings and for other animals. Um, well, I think you know these discussions have, have a lot of different notions of what creativity means. If creativity is making something that didn't exist before in a sense, like almost anything you do, you know, cooking a meal or uh, um, transforming your world is a creative act. But I think that that's, that's a pretty different notion than what we think of when we think of um, the creativity involved in making art. Um, uh, but it, it, I, mean, I definitely, you know, um, uh, I like, you know, very much like the idea of tools and appendages uh, as appendages of our own existence. I mean, you mentioned the, um, you know, the, the way we interact with the environment that like in a way that the video camera might be seen as part of extending our umwelt into the world um, as if the video camera is an extension of our um, uh, our own senses. Uh, one of my colleagues um, who writes about this, uh, he, uh, I, I don't I know this, I don't, I doubt it's original, but he describes a drawing as thinking with your hands, which is something I very much relate to, um, that you hold a pen and you draw a picture and then you um, produce 
you can think through ideas that way, just in the way like typing on a keyboard uh, is a way to think through ideas and writing is a way to think through ideas. In each of these, these situations, we're using these tools to um, enhance our own internal thought processes. And so in a way, that's another way to you know, maybe restate a little bit what you said as well. Thank you. That's fantastic. I love that we got to sugar gradients as a possible uh, litmus test for creativity. Uh, so thank you so much. We're out of time, everyone. Uh, thank, let's all thank uh, Aaron Hertzman for a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us for our first seminar event for this academic year. Um, please join us next week, uh, September 27th. We have a talk by Schwartz Riesman Faculty Fellow Cheyenne Guha. Uh, Cheyenne Guha is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information, Department of Computer Science. Uh, the talk is Deconstructing Risk in Predictive Risk Models. So we we'll look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you again, Aaron Hertzman, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.